So like I said, the, the, the other, we just, with Leslie, we were just talking about how you would go about filling out this sheet from the current contract, which is in that stack. I think, maybe it isn't, it's the, it's the least interesting of our sheets. Okay, um, thank you. How you would go about filling out this faculty evaluation sheet for a, an online instructor if I see. you had to evaluate one. Um, the, the idea in this other hour was to look at from the other way, the other side of how do you evaluate yourself okay. and how do you, how do you, you know, what, I found these rubrics really handy. Mm -hmm. When we started this project that I think um, you're involved in as well, the International College, Eric got a grant to get instructional design assistance for all the classes that are in the International College. Mm -hmm. and, and I had that assistance for a couple of courses. Mm -hmm. And I found the rubrics really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but I like this rubric a lot. It's from um, Cal State Chico. I found it by Googling online instruction evaluation or online instruction rubrics. It goes deeper and deeper hmm. in you know, all the different things you can do in your in your online um, your online course and how how can you make it better and better and better. So I thought we could have a conversation, which we just went through how what this. What this, among many other websites and rubrics, hold up as as good ways to run to, to set up an online class, and I uh, I didn't copy out this one because I actually like the other two better. Um, they're quite different, and I think they sort of show you the fact that there's a lot of different ways to run an online class. There's this there's a, a checklist from um, Southern Illinois University mm -hmm. and a checklist from um, Humboldt State, and there are lots of checklists out there. I think if you put them all together, you would have a, a checklist that went way beyond the, uh, the Southern Illinois 51 points. And I guess this uh, Humboldt one is even longer. Um, so I do find it helpful to just keep you know, going over these lists and adding stuff. And I admire your, let's get it all right the first time. That's great, but also Etudes lets you keep changing it. Mm. And that's a great thing about it, is that you can say, you know, at the end of the term, one thing I like to do is just look through my gradebook and see where were the lows, where, where are the clumps of low scores, and try to figure out what didn't work there, mm -hmm. and try to fix it, which I'm not always able to do, but I can keep trying. So, um, I was thinking about, you know, what are the, the it, what kinds of things do we have available at West that we can use for, for this stuff? Um, helping the students feel comfortable and, and finding what they need, we've just put up, um, Juan Chacon has just put up this great website, mm -hmm. which you've been looking at. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you link to that sort of thing and you pretty well got that covered, mm -hmm. I think. It's got a lot of stuff in there. It'll it'll never be done. There's there's always going to be more. Um, what else could we What else could we offer in the way of beyond this in the way of help for students as they get started? Do you have any things going in your class? We haven't actually launched any classes mm -hmm. yet, so we're still. That's a great question. I mean, the more resources we can find like that, I think. Um, perhaps one thing that, that, that I use myself that, that I would recommend students explore, and I don't have a comprehensive list of what's best for students, but are um, virtual note-taking systems. So I use Evernote, oh. Evernote, for example. I love Evernote. I don't know if you've ever used I've it. I've just been reading about them. I haven't tried one yet. Uh, Evernote is, I actually heard the founder speak at, at a conference, and uh, Based on his on his speech, I signed up for the service, and it's I haven't looked back. It's basically the ultimate note taking service. You can it's available on every uh, phone platform, every computer platform. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually on an Android. Ah, oh, that's um, even cooler. But essentially, you could go to any website 
and select text and click it. You, you have to download a little applet that lives in your browser and it will copy that text for you, save it to Evernote, you can tag it and it will, all, it will save the URL from where you, you know, where you link it from. So you can add any number of tags you want to. You can organize things by notebook so that if you're studying something and you want to remember it rather than having to cut and paste into a Word document, you just clip it into Evernote and it's instantly searchable, uh, keyword searchable, tag searchable. And you can put the same index card in two places without copying it, right? You can say, yeah. here are my ideas for the introductory week and here's yeah, you can, you proper can, pedagogical practices and the same card can exist in both. You can, and you can cross-link things and you can access it. You could, I could take a picture of this with my phone, send a note, send this as a note to my Evernote and then add notes later and, and link to stuff. So it's a really cool note-taking uh, service that's free and it's, it's web-based. So, and it's, and it's like um, Dropbox, mm -hmm. which it's cloud-based in the sense that it's, you're not tied to uh, any specific computer or service. So, so any, I, I find those resources extremely helpful, and those are the kind of things I'd probably like to have a resource link mm -hmm. available There's, for students. Yeah. The issue is how are you going to, how do you, uh, how much do you give them? How, how, how long are they going to spend in the class figuring out how to take the class before they start taking the class? Right. And that's something I think you would work on from semester to semester. Mm -hmm. You would see how well this worked and, and, and how applicable it's going to be in their later life. That sounds like something that would be very useful for like a screenwriter or a producer who has a lot of material to keep track of. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be a really good thing to learn. For my classes that are in the humanities and they're very, um, you know, they're college classes. They're, they're liberal arts in the sense of not being of any use. Um, I focus on tools that they, that things that they should know as college students. The mm. big one is what's plagiarism. Mm. So there are little tutorials out there, things you can link to. But that sounds very cool. I wrote it down. Wonderful. Remember what the note says. <laughs> there are there are, there are other services. I can email you. I mean, there are other services like that. Um, there's another. There's one I think that actually I found through maybe through one of Juan's links called Highlighter. Uh, and I think, I think um, Judy Baker put that in the users group. Like maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was from the users group. And, and, and it, it's, it's, it's very similar to Evernote, it's, but it's much more designed for students. You, you actually mm -hmm. highlight text and it, 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 it functions more like a highlighter. Evernote is like a clipper. It literally clips whatever you select and saves it as a separate editable document. That sounds great. I wish I had done that. <laughs> I can't find where I put my list of St. Where on the web is the clickable list of the St. Petersburg Internet Service Providers? Uh, and I thought it was so easy. I found it so easily, and now I can't find it again. Yeah. So, yeah, that would have been good to know. Our students have such varied uh, needs. It, it can be hard to to suss out what they need. And I found in my teaching that they really need to know that it's not about getting the right answers, and it's not about Googling the right answers, and it's not about copying them out. So, so that's what I focus on. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it should grow as I move along. Um, let's see, organization and design. It should be easy to navigate. So here's where I give my pitch, if I can get there. I don't think anybody should be without a full use of the course map. Have you started using the course no, map No, but we've been talking about it, actually, because that was one of the main questions, is how do you, it seems to make most sense to design your courses based on informational modules, but then how do you how do you how do, how do you structure those along whatever timeline the course is being offered? I was about to say we had been looking at this rubric, or I've been going through this rubric from Cal State Chico, which I should have made a Xerox of, but I didn't. I made some others. That tells you when you're thinking about your online course, it should be organized. And that's what students love it when your course is organized. Mm -hmm. Helps. 
And uh, have you been reading these discussions in the user group in Etudes about, I don't want course map showing in my class. Make it go away. Mm. No. And Vivi keeps writing back, no. The teachers are saying that? Yeah. Well, I think the reason is it's one more tool to master at the beginning of the semester. You thought you were just going to download your course right. and start. Yeah. And she's spraying it on them. Now maybe that was a mistake. In fact, I had to, I had to, I had to set up course map. It wasn't in my class. <laughs> then course map? Announcements? Yeah. I think I think there's a place for both. But look at it. This is basically what the student sees when they yeah. log on. This is what I want you to do. It's good, yeah. And it's automatic, except for um, these things, these um, headers or whatever they are. Mm -hmm. You add those. Mm -hmm. But you put all your stuff in your class yeah. with the dates, and they appear here. And that's all there is to it. And if you don't like one of the problems in A2s, I guess Jan hasn't taught in A2s. He's been working on a class, but he hasn't done it. One of the things that's been bothering people for a long time is that stuff comes in funny order. Mm -hmm. Like in the uh, students click on the on the assessment tool and they see all the assessments, but they'll be I'm, sometimes they seem to be ordered by the day they open, and sometimes they seem to be ordered by the day they close. And and people have been complaining for a long time. I don't want it there. The, the instructor can change the order of things. The students don't see this column. In fact, I think this is where their scores are. Mm -hmm. So they can click that and it takes it right to the feedback. So you're just organized. They don't let you not be organized anymore in any twos. And if you, if you didn't, or if you didn't order it, it would be a little bit confusing to the student, but they would still see everything in the course. And I, I think it did originally organize itself by the opening date. And then I went through and, and moved everything around. I wanted my module to be first, and then the discussions, and then the quizzes. So they see, students see at a glance when they click on the course map where they're supposed to be, what they haven't done. So what's, what's not to like? Well, <laughs> the only thing that feels missing is the assignment, like the page numbers, because like with the announcements, I could put everything. Mm. So it's a double thing. Like, okay, they have this, and then if I'm going to do the announcements, I had week one announcements, and I had page numbers and specific things. Oh. So it feels like it's not there. The announcements is a is a good place to put that stuff, especially now that announcements can be set up ahead of time. And it goes right to their email, so everybody gets it. Yeah. I put that in my modules, which was what the instructional designers told me to do. I have and it in I my outline. It. I have module outline and all the page and assignment. And so you're telling them twice. You're sitting at an announcement. The module is opening. You're going to read right. these pages of the textbook. You're going to do this discussion. You're going to do this quiz, et cetera, et cetera. But now I'm not doing announcements because I have this. Oh, you can do both. You can have three I don't now. want to do three. <laughs> <laughs> I want this to satisfy that. <laughs> or maybe this could be fit into announcements so that it goes out to the students with the page numbers or something. Yeah. But it doesn't have a place. You could put, you could have an assignment that says do the reading. Yeah. And all it is is you click it and it says do the reading. Yeah, I might have to do that. Or you, or you might even include some questions to bear in mind while you're doing the reading so that it makes a little more sense as an, as an assignment. Yeah. yeah. I could make the, the module outline just another blip on the, on the chart, I guess. Yeah, you don't have to have an out. I mean, you don't have to. I, have a, I put in a module. I don't know how this is going to work. I put in a module called Major Assignment. This, this is trying something new. You're always trying something new. That's one of the things I love about A2s is you can, it's so easy for us to change it, to yeah. try something. I found my students are not, are, they're often missing major assignments that opened in the modules. Like it, it, there was a module that said, and also this week, we, you have the first opportunity to start on this major assignment. Mm -hmm. It's in assignments as well. And even though I give it a, I, I may give it a, um, its own section so that it shows on the module sheet. 
they, the module page, they still are looking for it. So I tried something else this time. I made, I made a section called major assignments. So they'll see it in here. But it's only in, oh, I've only made it in the, in the, uh, on the course map. You could have another module. I could make a module that's in here that explains the major assignments separately. Mm -hmm. That's neat. That's a great idea. And the big problem is, how much are they going to read? If you tell it to them six times, does that mean they're going to say, I don't have to read what she sends me because she tells me everything six times. Mm -hmm. Six is definitely too many. But maybe one is not enough. Yeah. Of course, that is for me nice because it's like an automatic reminder. And it's very graphic. It's very visual. It's not something I have to... Um, I have to keep track of the schedule drove me bananas. There, were, there, there is still a schedule tool, and you can enter stuff into the schedule tool. But the first semester I used it, I forgot to put stuff in the schedule tool. So the students said, you didn't put it in the schedule, I don't have to do it. So I dropped that. I like these automatic things. The other thing that's great about this tool, I think, is this lock on this little box. If you click that box, Students cannot proceed to the next item on the list until they finished this item on the list. So my first block is my syllabus quiz. If you have not done the syllabus quiz, you cannot start the class. And that's how I'm going to get them to read the syllabus. You can also you can block the syllabus itself, but then they can't go beyond until they have gone to the end of the syllabus and clicked, I have read the syllabus. So I like giving them a quiz instead to make sure that they have some idea of you know, how it's laid out. And then you can remove that. And I'm going to remove it when the final time they can do the quiz passes this evening. I'm going to remove the block so that if there is anybody who hasn't done the syllabus quiz, I can, I, I can let them go on. I could check and see if there is anybody because I have, I have the activity meter which goes along with it. So well, I think that's a, this is a, this, so the course map, getting back to where I was, is a huge aid in being organized. And, and the other thing is when you go to start a new class, you can, you move the old shell into the new shell and, it all, and, it, and you set the base date and it populates the whole thing for you and then you just go through and adjust it. And it is, um, I think I've got all my dates right for a change. It also shows you that this is still closed. Students can't see it, but they will see it on this date, and then um, it'll close on this date, but it being a discussion, they'll no, that, that's a module. It being a discussion, they'll still be able to, to read it. So as far as that first step of being organized, the tool, the tools are beginning to come together. That was pretty. Now that's well that's Ron's new newly designed website for distance learning. You haven't oh, been on there yet? No. That's that's very cool. No, that's where we're now linking our students to if you uploaded your class from last semester with the links to services, they're broken. Um, but unless it's at the same, it may be at the same address. Yeah, it probably it is. Links to services. That probably didn't change the address. What know. do you mean links to services? I don't think. Well, in your syllabus or somewhere early in your class, you want to say, we have a bunch of services available for you. Like if you if you can't if, you know if you have a technical question yeah, go to the go to the help desk if you um, there there are there are um, tutorials on Medicaid and plagiarism and stuff at, at at this address so you can link it all through here and I think it's a nice way to link it because it gives them well we were just talking about how much do you give them you know. Um, they can they can sh they can browse around in here, although maybe some things you want to tell them. This this is what I think is really important for this class. So 
So, so we were looking at, um, I think a tooth does a lot of this for you. Now that we have the, now that, now that we have the, the course map, it should be easy to navigate. So far, we don't have a lot of student feedback on that because it only started in the middle of the summer. But the people are reporting that the students like it. Um, the design is pretty clear in Intuits, I think. The web pages are consistent. Now, Jan and his partner are trying to get around it by putting different backgrounds on their Etudes pages. Oh, that's nice. They're whiz kids. <laughs> and then um, accessibility issues are addressed, of course, is not something they do for you. You have to do this when you have a picture. I mean, I there are a lot of accessibility issues. The one that concerns me the most is I have a lot of still images. And knowing what this means, alternative text, this is where you write in what you think your student, your student who can't see the picture needs to know about the picture. It's a tough one. But Lucy also teaches art history. So if, if you were to have a blind student taking art history, what do they need to know about the picture that they can't see? Um, and I've had long discussions in the Etudes user group with Tahia about, she thinks we should describe every picture fully so that they don't need the picture. Describe? Describe the pictures so fully that the students don't need the pictures. And she's an artist. And she thinks this is something that should grow every time we teach the class. The students should add to the description so that you end up with this. With this. Who is that? That's this is Tahia. I can't remember her last name. She used to be one of the support people at Foothill, and now she's gone into the private world. And she's brilliant and passionate and devoted, and she really thinks that we should tell everybody everything they need to know about the picture so that if a blind person takes art history online, they can succeed. How about all the students that you're trying to have them see the picture? Right. And, and they're all going to read it and tell you about yeah. it. <laughs> Maybe yeah. they could just be selectively sent. To no, it, to be, I think it's called 503 compliant. I may have the name of the law wrong. There's a federal law that every institution gets federal funding, like us, has to be making progress towards being compliant with this law about being accessible to people with, with varying degrees of ability. I wonder if there are art pieces that come with something like that. We were wondering. So Juan and I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art site, and they and there he's got a website that you can plug another website in and see how compliant it is, and they are just like not compliant. My idea of an alternative text in there is the other side from ta Tahia's is describe the whole thing so they don't need to look at it, which I think is against the. Everybody can see alternative text if they know to, is it left click, right click, I have a hard time with it. You click the other button and, it, and you get information and you read it. And since so many students would rather read than look, or they've been told if, if it's not in the text, then it doesn't count. If it's not written down, it's not real. So they say if somebody wrote this is what Stonehenge means, then that's what it means. And if that's your impression from looking at it. Well, you just looked at it. That doesn't count. So this is a real struggle for an art historian. But it's also a struggle for other people. I, mean, I feel pretty comfortable writing in there the name of the image and the figure number in the textbook. Because if. Do they have pictures in Braille? So, some books are available with the pictures in raised. Yeah. And I've had, I once taught in pace where they make the students all take the same courses. And I did have severely visually impaired students in pace, and they had special readers that, that they could lay on their textbook and they could, they could, you know, the picture that was this big would be this big. And they could kind of make it out. So I'm figuring, you know, they go to the textbook and they, 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 they use that. So those are the extremes, but something should be there. Is there any money put towards that, doing this? Because I was thinking, I mean, 
I would have fun doing that with like two or three or four other people in the in the department, you know, like you and John, and you know a few others, and we would be paid, you know, as a group to go through, you know, ten images a week or ten images a day. For well, what a week. would we be doing? You We'd mean, be writing something that we uh -huh. use in all our our history classes. We'd but be it would vary. Description for the required for the yeah. the most important pieces. Anyway, it would be kind of fun. Well, I ask them questions about images like. Uh, in in this uh, Judas's kiss, which character tells the story best? Mm -hmm. And pick one and write and write how you how you can tell you know, what what why you think this great. figure is a good one and and what it is visually about it that makes it the good one. So you know this would go on for six pages. It would say Judas stands out because he's wearing a, a yellow cloak, and, and since we see him from behind, his his bulk is extra big, and and since he's, it, and it would keep you from looking at the picture, because there would be the answer that everybody is looking for. But you know what if you're teaching biology, and you've got the picture of the cell dividing. You're going to have to tell the student what it is you want them to be looking at in that picture. So that's a big accessibility issue. And then the other one is if you put in a video, we were just talking about, it not only needs to be closed captioned. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know if the, maybe the captions don't have to be readable because you can hear them. Yeah, but if, it's, if the, if the story is clear from the from the content of the video, you know, like a music video wouldn't be. It yeah, would just say music playing. The way music you get playing, it. exactly. Yeah. But, but it wouldn't, you wouldn't be able, if, if you couldn't see it, you would need someone to describe to you in the same way you would a painting. What's oh, that that's right. Like if, um, like, Scott showed us a video of Nancy Sander telling her English class what to do, and she was telling them everything. They didn't really need to know that there's a picture of a really nice looking woman. She looks real friendly, and she's sitting in her office. They don't need that. Right. But if, if what I've got is, here you see them scraping the hide, then we would have to add, you see this stretched out thing. And, and that, well, that's even, we're not that far with our accessibility. Because when you get stuff closed captioned, you can, through Eric's office, if you have a video that you want to use and it's not closed captioned, they can get it closed captioned for you. But all they do is write down what the person is saying. I don't think they say, they assume that you're either sight impaired or hearing impaired, not both. Now, the other thing about accessibility is, it's like keeping kosher. Nobody is actually kosher. You just try to keep kosher. You, Rabbi told me that. I said, well, how, if you can't eat broccoli, couldn't there be a bug on a bell pepper? So he said, no, no one actually is kosher. You just try to. Um, I'm trying to, because I've got this set up to switch between Etudes and the PowerPoint, I can't use a PowerPoint, I can't use this, the slideshow, because you have to exit the slideshow. It's really very, um, ample opportunities for interaction. Um, this, is, this is the next list from the, from the, um, from the, the Chico list that I started with. Um, I don't know. I think the first one's the first one. A two handles pretty nicely for us. We can have the students write to us. We can have the students write to each other. We can have the students write to everybody in public. Um, you can have them do group work. You can have them work out a give them a problem, have, them, have a group of them all work on it together, and then report out to the whole class, which I've never tried, but I'm thinking about it someday. My sister took a whole online um, human genetics class that consisted almost entirely of that. It was all uh, people who already had master's degrees in something related, and they were all, the teacher had them broken up into groups, and one group would, would deal with one issue and another group would deal with another issue and would break it up and then at the end of the week each group would 
report out to the other group. I don't, uh, I don't know if I've got the organizational skills to pull that off, but maybe maybe later I will. Um, student to content. You can you know give them quizzes. You can give them surveys. You can you can make it so that they're doing something. Now Lucy has all sorts of great ideas for getting students to interact with each other and produce things in the discussions, right? And I keep, I keep trying to steal them and then I can't remember them. <laughs> how, how do you get, how, what do you have in, I'm going away, so I can't take them to museums this year. How do I, how, what do you have them do that shows that they've been to a museum and thought about it? Two different things. Mm -hmm. One, um, they have an assignment that uh, the first paragraph has to be, I went, when I went to the museum, the first thing I saw or the first thing I did was, and, and I tell them, that way I know they went, if I, if I hear, they, when I, I couldn't find the, the piece I was looking for, so I walked up five stairs. You know, I can, I have to be able to picture it. But if it's in another country, I haven't been to that situation yet. But um, then, you know, then they report on the piece that they're talking about comparing and comparing it. But that's one of the things. And you also have them do something where that's interactive between the students. Yeah. Then um, it's called, I call it a museum detective. So every student supposedly goes to. So far, it, I, I think they have. You know, in all the last nine years that I've been using this, thing. they go to a museum, the Getty or whatever and they find the ancient art piece and they write about it, but they have to, in the discussion, they, they write about it with just like answering five sentences. They don't say what it is. They say, it is a nude in marble. It is meant to be a god. It is, yeah, yeah, you know, what is it? And then they have to have other students respond to what they think it is. Because they have, but every student who responds has to justify. I think that it is Alice taking a shower because <laughs> <laughs> because I hear the water, you know, whatever, you know. Uh -huh. um, because in our book, it, such and such a thing looks just like that, you know. And then, um, so that's so every student who participates has to respond to three to five other students. Anyway, so that's one. In, and then the other thing is that I've done is um, since everything is, the, most of the museums have their things online, their collections online, um, they go to the website and they get information about particular pieces that I have chosen and they write up a little five minute thing and then when we get to the museum they, they introduce the piece and talk about it and ask certain questions. So that's when you can go to the museum. That's, when that's for when you can. Yeah. Go to the museum. I, I think you could do that with. You might be able to create groups of people who wanted to do it for extra credit, and you could have them do that without you, and then report yeah. on it. You know, we we went to the Getty, and yeah, and you had had us look at all the images of the Trojan War, and and we and we tried to talk about. You know, Susie tried to explain why this was Odysseus under the ram, but Fred noticed that he's actually tied on, so it can't be Odysseus. And then Sarah said, well, wait a minute, he's holding on to the, on to the fur, so he, the fleece, so he really is Odysseus, and we realized it. And, and how would they, um, how would, what, they would write that in discussion? How would they submit that to you? Yeah, I think they'd work it, well, the thing is you want, you could do it for, like, like in my sister's genetics class, you could have them in the discussion group working out all sorts of things, you know. They could, they could do their research and discuss what they see in the pictures, but then how do you get them to go to the museum? Because they think they can see it all in the picture. So, something that mm -hmm. I'm still thinking about. It. I may not send it. I have one museum exercise where they compare uh, experiencing an object on the web in the museum website to going and seeing it. And if they go to a museum that I know, I can tell right. immediately whether they really went and saw it. You know, when somebody says, it was so huge, and I say, 
Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it does look monumental, but it's very small. <laughs> that um, kind of adversarial this, this process of thinking of how how to get how to engage them, how to how to get them interacting, how to design it. So, so, what are you going to be teaching in your film production class? Uh, Film production, essentially. So, <laughs> so, for example, we have an on-ground class right now called Film Production 100, which is our uh, prerequisite for all the other classes that we teach. And it's a survey course that covers the foundations of film production with an emphasis on what happens uh, with all the technical crafts that actually make a project. So one of the ideas that we've been exploring online is, is having students go through every mimic every phase of a, produ of a production in a, sim in a simpler fashion. So it would be technically complex to ask them to actually make a, a movie on their own. But what they could do is they can make what, what is sometimes called an animatic or a photo storyboard where we have them, they have to pitch an idea for a simple uh, story that's told through you know, panels, a series of panels or, or still images. And, and then they'll have to go out and scout the location and send us photographs of the locations where they're going to shoot it, and then take photographs. Yeah, take photo, and then uh, send us images of the, of the actors they want to cast. Kind of a, submit a simulated, you know, a, a mock budget for what they think it would cost if they had to pay for everything, or even if they do pay for things, if it costs us ten dollars, and then they have to shoot the actual project and then edit it together with sound and. Subtitles and music, if they want to add those things. So, they we're asking them to do what you know, either in groups, if they live in close proximity or alone, what we might do as a group in in class. Um, so that's the kind of a thing that we're exploring. But we have to have them create something that we can assess. But it has to be technologically simple enough that they can create it and we can assess it without too much trouble. Leslie's um, husband, incidentally, is, is they just launched, he works for a, a, a company that just launched a website that's a social, it's a, an online editing application. So if you ever wanted to have students edit uh, like a small video, mm -hmm. essentially you upload raw footage and then you, you, you edit it online as opposed to on a computer. Um, it sounds fairly simple, but as soon as you use a moving image versus a still image, it taxes computers exponentially more, which is why almost all editing is done on standalone systems. Uh -huh. So this is the first, it's not the first, but it's the, the first recent version where they're trying to uh, do what, you know, for example, Facebook has this thing where you can tag pictures. And I think this company's trying to do the same type of thing where you can take video, send it to your friends, and they can create mashups of it and do all kinds of stuff and tag it. But you could do something like that, you know. So you have to keep up with the, I mean, the stuff keeps coming. We think that's not possible, and then you turn around, and it is possible. I've, I've been stymied always thinking that students can't, I can't demand that everybody have a camera. But it's, it's that time is almost past. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, cell phones. I mean, now that's... Well, some people don't have cell phones. Yeah. We're, we're batting around whether to get cell phones in Russia. Because we, we don't know what our budget is. We don't know what things are going to cost there now. We have no idea. Yeah. And uh, so we have to, to get there and find out whether we can afford a cell phone. Yeah. And some of our students can't afford cell phones. Mm -hmm. Sure. But they probably have them anyway. But then, so, you know, students abroad, you know, very hard to know. Well, I think we've we've got a lot of good ideas. We'll be fine. Um, assessment. Um, timely activities ex assess student readiness for course content and mode of delivery. Regular timely feedback about student performance. How timely are you? What do you do to keep yourself? Well, you haven't taught online, so you don't know. What do you do to keep yourself on time? Or does it doesn't matter, or you just do it naturally? 
No, I mean things open and close at times. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Well, when students are submitting stuff, do you have to set yourself a schedule for reading it, or are you just so for eager? reading them? Yeah. Usually, I read them as they come in. Sometimes, and then I can send them back and say, "How about?" I didn't get that until I got this instructional designer to, you know, Eric assigned an instructional designer to me to help me. And um, there were two of them actually, he and she. They had me put in my syllabus that I would respond to to emails within 24 hours and oh. and grade all work within a week. And that made a tremendous difference for me. It doesn't sound like you, you need that. You just are ready, do it. No, oh, sometimes I put it off if I have a big commission or something. Mm -hmm. But I tell them it'll be done by the end of the week or something like that. I you know, apologize. And yeah. Well, they had me put in. You mean make it so it's really in a disciplined, organized way. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Well, what I had to train myself to do was to log on every day. And I actually try to log on twice a day mm -hmm. and just answer everything that's come up. Try, then the problem is, in the discussions, not over answering. I keep I keep putting up postings and then erasing them because I maybe a student is going to say that, which sometimes they do. Um, but I, I would get really you know behind. You skip a day and then you turn you you go in. There's way too much stuff to read and and it's not fun anymore. But if you can just be disciplined and, and check it every day. Well, what they wanted me to put in my syllabus and I think I did the first time was I'll answer within 24 hours on a weekday and 48 hours on the weekend. And I have since gone to where I say I will answer within 24 hours unless I tell you that I'm not going to, which happened when I went to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote them and I said I'm going to go stand up for labor in Wisconsin, so I may not be able to, to respond to you for until I get back on Thursday. And it um, worked really well. So t tomorrow I'm going to say, getting on a plane for St. Petersburg, and I won't be able to respond until I wake up in the hotel on Thursday morning, which is your Wednesday midnight. <laughs> so exciting. I hope I have some brains left over by then. <laughs> They're all leaking out, <laughs> and it's not, I don't even have jet lag yet, and my brains are really <laughs> leaking out. Peer feedback. Peer feedback is hard. I haven't gotten into that. That's a good idea. It's a hard one. I have an assignment. It's an extra credit assignment where I ask them to take somebody else's discussion and kind of expand on it. And it absolutely doesn't work, even though it's in private. I can ima can't imagine what would happen if I... I'm beginning to get students who I think have been trained that they have to respond a lot in the discussions. So I'm getting people who keep saying, oh, that's really good. <laughs> oh, that is so interesting. I love what you said. It keeps, you know, and I guess that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not very helpful. Yeah. It's not very engaging. I think, you know, I've got this, um, I've got this list of things that were sort of struck me as interesting when I was working on the PowerPoint, but I also have these, these two handouts, which are, you know, each of them, half dozen things, not, not the, not the uh, not one from our contract, which is probably on its way out anyway because the contract is being renegotiated, but the one from Southern Illinois and the one from, and the one from Cal State Humboldt, they, they both are just a list of stuff that you really ought to do or you really ought to make happen. This is um, Southern Illinois. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. And this is, this one's about Humboldt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they're get all your students to publish a photograph of themselves. I don't know about that. Did you see the last semester a girl put a picture of herself sitting in a chair with net stockings and a bikini looking oh. extremely kind of grossly seductive. You know, and who knows? The, and I saw so I I kind of said something to her privately. The picture stayed in. People started responding to her just like any other student. But it was really a 
distracting photograph. And anyway, so Vivi uh, finally just took her out. And she and another person with her same last name didn't um, stay in the class anyway. Mm. But it was just crazy. It's interesting. It's interesting what people... High, high heels and, you know, just sitting there. <laughs> yeah. It's funny what people put online, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, I, uh, when I teach face-to-face, -face, I have trouble with names, so I, I use a name card system. I take roll by handing, by putting the name on the person's desk as they come in. And I always ask them what they want to be called. Mm -hmm. And one guy wanted to be called, I believe, Miss, no, he wanted to be called Super Pimp. <laughs> and so I put it on his card, and then every couple of weeks I would say, do you still want to be called Super Pimp? And he stuck with it all semester. Mm -hmm. And then he told me later, it's very embarrassing in walking around campus, and there, there are 30 people on campus who don't know my name. They only know me as Super Pimp. That's and, embarrassing. And that's what they call me. <laughs> you finally figured it out. <laughs> that was a little embarrassing. <sighs> well, live and learn. Assessment and evaluation. We do that. We give quizzes. I get, you have to give open book quizzes, I think. This is the first time I've given them two tries. Yeah? I've never done untimed two tries. How many get 10 out of 10? Not everybody. Oh. I, I thought that would, get, that would encourage multiple guessing. Do they, do, when they get their feedback, do they see which question they got wrong? Or they just see that they got a question wrong? Well, I um, don't. It's closed until the you know the last day. So the first time they're probably guessing. All they see is the score. All they, they see, see is it's the not score. perfect, and then right. they so they try it again. Right. That might be a good idea for me because my questions are tricky. But then I don't know if they ever catch it. I, I know. I thought I'd just try it this time because nobody ever got ten out of ten even on time one time. Oh. So I thought I'd see, and now I'm seeing a lot more nines. So it's just I do get a lot of perfect scores. I mean, not like a lot, but there's in every quiz there's usually a perfect score because they are open book. Yeah, it is in the book. I did. You know, I've got the book open in front of me while I'm making the quiz, and the whole point of it is to get them to read the book, right. which I guess evaluates student learning, but it doesn't really. It just evaluates whether they well, it evaluates whether they figured out how to read the textbook. I think what, what gives them much more is 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 um, giving them feedback about their discussion, which I think you've, you've seen my discussion. I'd like to see because I really don't. I just use it for that game, you know, the museum detective, and maybe one other thing. Oh, I use it all the time. Okay. I mean, it's the heart of my course I is know. the discussion. Uh, I have them write about answer a specific question that requires in the art history class that they look at an image and talk about what the image looks like. And I work on all the questions that way. Point out where. I know. Can you give me an example? Well. Do you have one on any time? Let's see. Oops. Yeah. Um, the question here was, um, this is humanities, it's not straight art history, so I, to be accessible, every discussion involves, has a choice of text or image. So if somebody can't handle images, they can do the text. In the module, I said, um, you'll read in the textbook how important the Nile was for the Egyptians. Go to one of these primary sources, painting from the tomb of Nebelman, painting from another tomb of the Hymn to the Atem, and characterize the Nile on the basis of that thing. So this is a, an outside link. You're saying go to well the in the module. I mean, if they if they started with course map. Yeah. Let's see how well this navigation works. I, I haven't tried it. You go so in reading the Egypt module. Oops. And hopefully you're reading it in order. But so you've got the Egypt module, and say you've already read it. So now you're going to review the discussion. So I introduce it that I'm trying to get them to work with their own experience of the art and literature as opposed to Googling the answers. 
which I don't think, I think I said at the bottom of the page. So, um, what I want you to do is, um, so everyone says the Nile was central to the Egyptians' concepts of their world. If this is so, we should be able to see it ourselves, how central it is. In Fierro, our textbook, there are two Egyptian images showing the river and, and a hymn to Aten that includes imagery of the river. Use one of these, either the hymn or one of the photographs, to make a statement about this particular view of the Nile. And then I give them an example. Could you read, one might look at this image from the tomb. This, this image from the tomb of Senegem. The river looks very The river looks, I think you could say it looks very regular. That's the characterization. It flows in a rectangular grid. Mm -hmm. So I explained to them that I've made a statement about the view. It's very regular and pointed out something that anyone could literally put their finger on in the image. I spend a lot of time explaining, I see that means literally, not I agree with you, but I do see that. Mm -hmm. So they go to the discussion, hopefully. You can't link from the discussion yet. That would be nice. So they go to the discussion. They pick, they go to the Nile discussion, and they have a choice of these two images and this hymn to use. And what I do is I read it, and I read it with the mindset that I am searching for their nuggets. I'm not looking for what they did wrong. I'm looking right. for where they got it. And when somebody tells me, gives me a, a view of the Nile, I, may, I turn it in, into purple. I click edit, and I highlight in, in the text. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Uh, the only thing is you have to be careful because if you if you blow it you can't erase their <laughs> but I've I've only done it like twice yeah. in the in the years that I've been doing doing this. It's a lot of years. Um, so I I use the edit and I make the the um, observation the Nile River looks as though it continues in a cycle is what what I can see. It does go mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. I didn't highlight because it has a circular shape because actually it's rectangular, but a <laughs> cycle. Right. Uh, and and um, I can also see, in addition to gods and ancestors floating on the river, the Egyptians are tending to their animals, planting crops, and doing rituals. This makes me think that the relationship is cyclical and holistic. So I'm giving them feedback here. Um, I explain as soon as I do it, um, we're not going to become Egyptologists. But if somebody says to us, you know, the Nile wasn't all that important for Egypt, we don't have to say, yes, it was. I read it in a book. Right. We say, oh, but think about the tomb of Senegem. The river is the frame. The ri Everybody's standing on the river. Uh, you know, you have all these things that you know they're actually true because you saw it. Yeah. And if, or with the hymn of hymn of the of hymn to the Aten, the the fishes are do something when the sun hits them and the barges sail upstream and downstream and that's how I know yeah. that the Nile is a place of great activity for the Egyptians. That's so good. they're making the, it, the connections themselves right there. And I do that all the way through the course and I keep um, highlighting and when they have something to highlight and it's hard. I mean look at this yeah. one. Yeah. It doesn't, it's all true but it's not in the text that they're reading. Right. Even I even looked it up. It's not in the lines that they're citing. They people want to say, you know, they I can have my opinion. My opinion is this is just art. So my everybody's opinion is is equally valid. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, your opinions are not that interesting unless you can tie it to the art that we're dealing with mm -hmm. together. And your so it's opinion, observation, observation, opinion, back and mm -hmm. forth, and back and forth. Then I try to get them to do this with each others, give them an, an extra credit essay where they can take a, a statement that somebody made, tell me that they're going to use that statement and expand it. And so somebody can take this and say, and write an essay on how the Nile is a place of activity for the Egyptians. And they could analyze this poem and they could analyze, they could analyze all three of the objects mm -hmm. of the evidences, but they have a lot of trouble with that. 
about how to do it. So, I think we're, we've reached our time. I, I want to say something I said to the other group. <laughs> that, um, I realized when I, was a, when I was raising little kids that there's no right way to do it. Yeah. There are definitely wrong ways to do it. <laughs> and, and I've tried some of those online too. Um, but there are, there are so many different right ways to do it that I think, you know, just like I go through here and look at right ways to interpret the, the hymn to the octave. And I actually, the really cool thing for me is I find new stuff all the time. Yeah. I never noticed. I often, like this one I'm saying, it talks about making an island in the underworld. I never noticed that in the hymn to the octave. So I look it up and sure enough it's not there. <laughs> But um, that's too bad. But sometimes people point out something in an image that I have been looking at since 1972. Right. <laughs> and I've been looking at it. I wrote a paper about it in 1972. And somebody points out something that I never noticed before. Wow. And it happens all the time. So that's, that's really fun.